Da. Hello, hello. Thank you for uh, having me here. Uh, it's wonderful to be here with you. So uh, I wanted to thank Andres and everyone here in the audience for attending this incredible event. Uh, my name is Dylan Thuris, and I started an organization uh, called Atlas Obscura. And so uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself, about what I do, about Atlas Obscura. Uh, but to do that, I want to take you back in time uh, to my childhood to tell you about why I am the way that I am. Uh, so I grew up in that slightly forbidding place known as the Midwest. Uh, and as a kid growing up in the Midwest, that meant that the family vacations that I took were not extravagant trips around the world, but were these never-ending road trips. Uh, you know, six hours between locations. And so on these trips with my parents, you know, we would drive to South Dakota and see Mount Rushmore and North Dakota and see family. And on one of these trips, we went to a place that I've never forgotten. We went to a town in Wisconsin called Spring Green, Wisconsin. And we visited a site called the House on the Rock. And there's a story behind the House on the Rock. The story is that there was an architect uh, named Alex Jordan Jr. who wanted to work for Frank Lloyd Wright. And he brought blueprints to Frank Lloyd Wright. And Frank Lloyd Wright told him, I wouldn't hire you to build a tree crate or a chicken coop, and sent him on his way. And so heartbroken, he went on and he built this strange Frank Lloyd wrong, if you will. So he, he built this strange house and he started adding more and more to it. And by the time I visited this place when I was 12, it had become this crazy, sprawling, unbelievable thing. And inside of this house, which took about five hours to walk through, there was the world's largest indoor carousel. There was a hallway that looked like it went on for infinity. And there was a squid fighting a whale the size of the Statue of Liberty. And as a 12-year-old, I thought, if this is what's in the woods of Wisconsin, what is in the world? And I had this sense that maybe the world was hiding something from me. Maybe there was things to be discovered if I knew how to look for them. And as I got older and became a teenager in Minneapolis, I was a straight edger. I didn't drink. I didn't do drugs. But I still, hmm, needed to, I still needed to get into trouble. And so uh, that meant exploration. Here I am as a teenager in Minneapolis. I, I definitely thought I looked like that guy, but 100% looked like that guy. Uh, and so I started exploring this city that I grew up in, and I fell in love with graffiti, because graffiti was this way to find these places that were hidden from the rest of the world, and it was like being shown this secret layer that no one else could see. And it brought me to these unbelievable locations. Uh, and in fact, on my first trip uh, ever to Mexico, it was a high school trip with my sophomore Spanish class, I got the only tattoo I ever have, I snuck away, 14 years old, and got a little tattoo of a spray paint can that says forever on it. When you're 14, forever means like a totally different thing. Uh, so graffiti brought me to all of these incredible locations, and I just had a chance to experience this hidden world. And as I grew up and got interested in writing and traveling, I created Atlas Obscura, and it was founded in 2009. And the goal was to take all of these incredible hidden wonders that myself and my co-founder Joshua Foer knew about and add them to this, this map, this database of places. And then other people could come along and add the incredible places that, that they knew about. And this was an art project, a kitchen table project. And we weren't sure if it would work, but we launched this site. And incredibly, people did start to add these amazing locations. So what, what did they add to Alice Obscura? Well, the Eiffel Tower is not a good example of an Atlas Obscura site, but the tiny hidden apartment at the top of the Eiffel Tower where Gustav Eiffel would take luminaries like Thomas Edison and they would go up and look out over Paris and laugh maniacally or whatever they did up there. That is an Atlas Obscura place. Places like this, Raw Paulette's Caves. Raw Paulette is an artist who late in life discovered that his medium was not sculpture, not exactly, not painting, but 
entire caves. He finds little sandstone caves and sculpts them into these incredible, unbelievable creations. Places like Ball's Pyramid, this giant, enormous spire uh, off the coast of Australia that was thought to be devoid of life for, for years until some entomologists went there in 2001 and found the very last Lord Howe Island stick insects. The last 24 of this bug was discovered on that island and has been rehabilitated and reintroduced to the world. And places like uh, this, which I discovered myself uh, on a, a trip through Florence, Italy. So I was going to the uh, Florence History of Science Museum because the line for the Uffizi was just too long. So we went around the corner and in among the armillary spheres and the telescopes was one little human fragment. And next to this human fragment, there was a little placard that read, Galileo's middle finger. <laughs> and I thought, that feels like people should be more excited about this. Uh, and so now the museum makes a bigger deal out of it, and they've actually collected other little bits of Galileo. Maybe if you wait long enough, they'll make a new one. Uh, but so these are the kinds of places that we were looking for in Atlas Obscura. And our whole mission is to inspire that sense of curiosity and wonder and surprise that I had as a 12-year-old at House on the Rock. And we do this in a number of ways now. So we've written a, a couple of books. Uh, this is the first in the revised edition of Atlas Obscura. And we wrote a kid's book, The Guide for the World's Most Adventurous Kid, uh, because children are naturally curious explorers. And we run events. We, uh, this is a, an event we had at the New York Explorers Club, where basically adults could have a sleepover here and learn about these artifacts from Arctic and Antarctic expeditions. And we run trips all around the world. So this is one of the first international trips we ever ran to a place called Buzludza, one of the greatest pieces of abandoned communist monument uh, ever built. It's this unbelievable saucer-shaped building. Uh, it was mac immaculate and very beautiful at the height of its existence and now is sort of slowly crumbling. So we take people to these kinds of places. Uh, we go to Romania to visit a salt mine where they uh, built an entire strange kind of amusement park inside. We go to the Amazon and encourage people to make new friends of all kinds. <laughs> and the thing I've gotten to see doing all this work is that travel is changing. The way people are traveling is transforming extremely rapidly. The phone, Google Maps, all of this information at our fingertips are bringing people uh, farther than they've gone before and also encouraging a kind of desire for unique experience. Travel is incredibly powerful. It is 10% of all economic activity in the world. One of five new jobs is in the travel sector. It has the power to reshape the world. And I can see that it is doing just that in ways both good and bad. So this is something maybe we're familiar with. This is a beautiful shot of some brave soul who's ventured out onto this cliff called Trolltunga in Norway. They're sitting out here having a reflective moment on Trolltunga. So this one person has incredible experience, but maybe more than one person has done it. And in fact, maybe when you go to Trolltunga, it looks a little bit more like this, which is basically a line for an Instagram photo. And you know, it's important for us at Atlas Obscura to help travelers separate fact from fiction, to understand the reality of a place. It's important for people to understand, as journalists, we want to make sure people understand, for example, you know, how many people they're going to encounter at a place or an event. Facts and honesty matter, period. And they matter because what we envision in our mind's eye is no longer necessarily the truth of the world. This is what Barcelona looks like in our heads. This is what Dubrovnik, Croatia, looks like when we imagine it, or Venice, Italy. But if you go to these places, they look more like this. Each day, 60,000 visitors come to Venice during high season. Venice has a total number of residents of 55,000 people. More tourists there are, come there in a day than the people who live there. It takes an hour to walk through a 300-meter section of Dubrovnik. And 750 cruise ships dock in Barcelona, and it is not going over very well with the locals. Why call it tourist season if we can't shoot them? 
It's a good question. So on the one hand, over-tourism is this enormous, enormous problem, but I have a very unique perspective working on Atlas Obscura. I see the other end of this spectrum. I see places like this. This is a place called Kovacs Planetarium, and it's up in my neck of the woods, up in Wisconsin. And this is a guy who hand-built his very own planetarium. By hand, he built all of the mechanics. He painted every glow-in-the-dark star, 5,000 of them, so that people could come and sit in this dome and experience this incredible wonder. But he couldn't get enough people to come visit, so he had to shut it down and go back to work in the machine shop. Or in Vicksburg's, uh, Vicksburg, Mississippi, this is uh, Margaret and Reverend Dennis. Margaret's first husband was killed in a robbery, and she was devastated and heartbroken. And then she met Reverend Dennis, and Reverend Dennis told her that if they married, he would build her a heaven. And he went on to do just that. They built this incredible wonderland, this beautiful piece of folk art magic. But they both passed away in 2012, and it's since fallen into ruin. And it may not actually be able to be saved. So this is the kind of other side of the spectrum, this heartbreaking loss of incredible wonders. And it just feels like these cannot be the two options. Incredible things disappearing because not enough people see them, and Venice and Barcelona being absolutely crushed. But I think there is a middle way. And I have some examples that give me hope. So I'm going to tell you a, a kind of a strange travel success story. So this is a place in Tonopah, Nevada, called the Clown Motel. So it's the last stop before you enter the desert. And it is a clown-themed motel with 700 clowns. <laughs> and it's been there since the 1990s. And it just happens to be located directly next to an old abandoned miner cemetery. So for a long time, no one thought that much of this. And, and Tonopah was a very uh, sleepy town. And then, in the mid-2000s, people noticed this and started telling its story, and something funny happened. People started making a pilgrimage to the Clown Motel. And one guy actually even started a Kickstarter as a joke and said, if I raise enough money, I'll go live in the Clown Motel for a month. Uh, Unfortunately for him, he did raise enough money and then was forced to live in the Clown Motel for a month. And this can seem silly, but the reason I bring it up is actually all of this traffic, these, these people making the pilgrimage, it matters to the town of Tonopah, Nevada. 2,500 people live here. Everyone who visits goes and they either stay at the Clown or they stay at the other hotel, they get a drink at the bar, they eat at the restaurants. It makes a difference. That spreading out of that economic impact really matters. And it's not just something silly like the Clown Motel. It's stuff that we really, really want to hold on to in this world. So when we first started out with Subscura in 2009, one of the first places that got sent in was this. And the guy wrote to us and he said, I run a small bed and breakfast in Cherrapunji, India, and we have these things here that no one knows about and they're in danger of disappearing. And went on to describe the living root bridges of Cherrapunji, India. So these are not built, but grown. Over the course of about 10 or 15 years, the roots of two ficus elastica trees are woven together until they become an incredibly strong living bridge. And they work because it's an incredibly wet region, so during the rainy season, the water goes all the way up to that second level. But these were going to disappear. There was no economic support, and people were coming and draining the latex out of the trees and just putting up steel cable bridges instead. But over the last 10 years, these have gotten some attention. A uh, sustainable economic tourism program has been built around them, and they are now being well taken care of. New bridges are being grown, and they're going to be around for the next 50 or 100 years. And that, to me, is the very core of what Atlas Obscura is here to do in the world. There's another bridge halfway around the world that is a similar success story. So this is a place called the Quechua Chaca in Peru. And it's special for a couple of reasons. I, I visited here in 2010. And first off, this bridge is woven entirely out of grass. Every year, the four villages around the Quechua Chaca come together, cut down a tremendous amount of grass, tie it, like you roll it into sort of rope, you weave that into larger uh, cables, and in this way, you create a new, unbelievable suspension bridge each year. It's also the last little piece of the Incan Empire, a little chunk left over from the road empire that once spanned across South America. And the tourism that has come to this place, drawn slowly away from Machu Picchu, which is really overwhelmed with people, has meant building schools and building libraries and other things that the town is benefiting from. So 
all of these things show me that there is another way. And this is what I've spent basically my adult life doing, is thinking about how you get people away from these over-tourist places and bring them to new incredible wonders. This is a place called the Gates of Hell in Turkmenistan. It is not, in fact, a volcano. It is an industrial accident. So in the 1970s, Soviet petroleum geologists came to this region, to the desert, set up a natural gas rig, accidentally punched through into a giant cavern, and the whole thing fell in, creating this huge hole, which was also leaking deadly natural gas. So these Soviet petroleum geologists did what they thought was the sensible thing. They lit the hole on fire. It has been burning for 45 years. It's burning right now. So my goal is to share these incredible places and get people to places like Turkmenistan, where they might not otherwise go. But it's also to remind people of the wonders in their own backyard. Right here in Puebla, you have some unbelievable things. You have, of course, the Coex Comate, this wonderful tiny volcano with a little spiral staircase going down into it. This is unbelievable. You have a tiny muse a museum of miniatures in the Hotel Messine de San Sebastian. I, I think most people don't even know this is here, but it's a tiny set of painstaking worlds that anyone who wants to visit can go find. And of course, you have the Puebla tunnels. Ten kilometers of tunnels run under this city, long thought to be folklore. These were discovered only in 2015. Wonders are not just around us. They are literally <laughs> beneath us. This city is incredible. I'm going to tell you one final story. This is my very last story. So years ago in South America, I visited a place called Gacta Falls. Now, Gacta was this tiny little town at the base of this enormous waterfall. And it was a town in need of economic support, in need of tourism. It didn't have good roads, it didn't have good electricity, but it did have this giant waterfall. And in 2005, a German hiker came through the area, looked at this waterfall, and thought, wow, that is a really tall waterfall. I wonder how tall it is. And he came back the next year, 2006, brought surveyor's equipment, and he measured the waterfall, which might be the most German thing anyone has ever done. <laughs> so it turns out that Gacta Falls is one of the tallest waterfalls in the world. By some measurements, the third tallest waterfall in the world. And I went to Gacta later, and I asked them, I said, you were this tiny town who wanted tourism, who wanted support from the government. Why didn't you tell the world about this? Why weren't you shouting it from the rooftops? And they said, you know, we knew the waterfall was wonderful, but compared to all the other wonders in the world, we thought, how special could it really be? And we just stopped noticing it. We all live at the base of Gacta Falls. We all live surrounded by incredible wonders. And it's up to us to lift our head and see what's right in front of us. And if we can do that, then the world truly becomes epic. Thank you so much. <laughs>